Talk. Their conversation eased me completely. Frivolous, mercenary, heartless, and senseless. It was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener. A card of mine lay on the table. This being perceived brought my name under discussion. Neither of them possessed energy or wit to belabor me soundly, but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in their little way, especially Celine, who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects, deformity, deformities, she termed them. So he's, Rog, remember, Rochester's eavesdropping on them right now, and Celine's insulting him, and not even just talking about his defects, but calling them de deformities, which is terrible. Now it had been her custom to launch out into fervent admiration of what she called my beauté male, like male beauty, wherein she differed diametrically from you, who told me point blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome. So at least Jane's being honest, whereas Celine was not. The contrast struck me at this time, and Adele here came running up again. Monsieur, John has just been to say that your agent has called and wishes to see you. Ah, in that case I must abridge. Opening the window, so now he's going to shorten the story. I walked in upon them, liberated Celine from my protection, gave her notice to vacate her to hotel, offered her a purse for immediate exig um, <laughs> exigencies, disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, protestations, convulsions, made an appointment with the Vicomte for a meeting at the Bois de Boulogne. The next morning, I had the pleasure of encountering him, left a bullet in one of his poor... <laughs> etoliated arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken in the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. But unluckily the, unluckily, the Varen, six months before, had given me this fillet Adele, whom she affirmed was my daughter, and perhaps she may be, though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written in her countenance. So he decided that as a consequence, he would take everything from Celine. She wouldn't be able to stay at the hotel. He gave her a little bit of money to live on for a little bit. And then the guy she had been cheating on him with, he shot in the arm. So good times. But unfortunately, Adele was six months old. And she, um, Celine said that Adele was his daughter, even though she, Rochester doesn't think Adele looks like him at all. Pilot is more like me than she. So he's even saying that a dog looks more like him than Adele does, which is harsh perhaps, although I think dogs are cute, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he means it to be um, a compliment. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned her child and ran away to Italy with the musician or singer. I acknowledge no natural claim on Adele's part to be supported by me, nor do I now acknowledge any, for I am not her father. But hearing that she was quite destitute, I e'en took the poor thing out of the slime and mud in Paris and transplanted it here to grow up clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. Mrs. Fairfax found you to train it. And he's referring to Adele as an it, which is terrible. It's like a dog. But now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl, you will, you will perhaps think differently of your post and protege. You will be coming to me some day with notice that you have found another place, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, etc., etc. Eh? No. Adele is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her, and now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoilt pet of a wealthy family who would hate her governess as a nuisance to a lonely little orphan who leans toward her as a friend? Oh, that is the light in which you view it. Well, I must go in now, and you too. It darkens. But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adele and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battle door and shuttlecock. When we went in and I had removed her bonnet and coke, coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which betrayed her in a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. Still, she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I saw in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression announced relationship. It was a pity. If she could have just been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. It was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me. 
As he had said, there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself. A wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer and her treachery to him were everyday matters enough, no doubt, in society. But there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysm of emotion which had suddenly seized him when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and its environs. I meditated wonderingly on this incident but gradually quitting it as I found myself for the present inexplicable, inexplicable, I turned to the consideration of my master's manner to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed to tribute to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had now for some weeks been more uniform towards me than at first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur. When he met me unexpectedly, he did, um, the encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by my formal invitation to his presence, I was honored by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him and that these evening conferences were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. I indeed talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind unacquainted with the world glimpses of its scenes and ways. I did not mean its corrupt, corrupt scenes and wicked ways, but such as derived their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterized. And I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered and imagining the new pictures he portrayed and following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. Noxious is like annoying. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. The, friend, the friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, I like the alliteration there, friendly frankness, correct as cordial, with which he treated me, drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master, yet he was imperious still. Um, sometimes still, but I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added to life that I ceased to pine after kindred. My thin crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved. I gathered flesh and strength. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude in many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering to me, cheering than the brightest fire. Yet I had not forgotten his faults. Indeed, I could not, for he brought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic, harsh to inferior, inferiority of every description. In my secret soul, I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I, more than once, when sent for to read to him, found him sitting in his library alone, with his head bent on his folded arms, and when he looked up, a morose, almost malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believed that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality, I say former, for he now seemed corrected of them, had their source in some cruel cross of fate. I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles, and purer tastes than such as circumstances had developed, educated, um, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought there were excellent materials in him, though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was, and would have given much to assuage it. Assuage means to make it better. So she's assuming he's better and that he's changed. We don't know that yet, though, because she likes him, and so you always look for the best in people that you like. Though I had now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue and told how his destiny had risen up before him and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. Why not? I asked myself. What alienates him from the house? Will he leave it again soon? So that's like a key question. What does alienate him from the house? We don't know. Mrs. Fairfax said he seldom stayed here longer than a fortnight at a time, and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent spring, summer, and autumn. How joyless sunshine and fine days will seem. I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious, which sounded, I thought, just above me. So she's not even sure if she's asleep, but she's saying even summer days, she wouldn't be happy if Mr. Rochester were to be gone for like three quarters of the year. Like imagine not seeing your crush for like nine months, right? Or whatever. 
Um, I wished I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits depressed. I rose and sat up in bed listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquility was broken. The clock far down the hall struck two. Just then it seemed my chamber door was touched, as if fingers had swept the panels and groping away along the dark gallery outside. I said, who is there? Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once I remembered that it might be Pilot, who, when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I'd seen him lying there myself in many mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again in, through the whole house, I began to feel the return of slumber. But it was not fated that I should sleep that night. And that's foreshadowing. She's not going to sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear when it fled affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing incident enough. There, this was a demon, um, demonic laugh, low, suppressed, and deep, uttered, as it seemed, at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laughter stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow, but I rose, looked round, and could see nothing. While, as I still gazed, the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt. My next, again to cry out, who is there? Something gurgled and moaned. Are we reading a horror book now, guys? Ere long, steps retreated to the gallery toward the third story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. Was that Grace Poole? And is she po possessed with a devil? thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and a shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at the circumstance, but still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim as if filled with smoke. And while looking to the right hand and left to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a sm strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax. I thought no more of Grace Poole or the laugh. In an instant, I was within the, the chamber. Tongues of flame darted round the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapor, Mr. Rochester lay stretched motionless in deep sleep. Wake, wake, I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. So smoke is really dangerous. It, you don't get as much oxygen, so you can't think straight. It's also extremely, like, not okay for her to be in a man's bedroom at night, right? It's not protocol. It's not, like, what polite society does. So she's breaking these protocols to save him. Not a moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and ewer. Fortunately, one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water. I heaved them up, deluged the bed and its occupant, flew back to my own room, brought my own water jug, baptized the couch afresh, and by God's aid succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element, the breakage of the pitcher which I flung from my hand when I emptied it, and above all, the splash of the shower bath I liberally dis bestowed, roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake, because I heard him fulminating strange anathemas at finding himself lying in a pool of water. Is there a flood, he cried? No, sir, I answered, but there has been a fire. Get up, do, you are quenched now. I will fetch you a candle. In the name of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jane Eyre? He demanded. What have you done with me, witch, sorceress? Who is in the room beside you? Have you plotted to drown me? I will fetch you a candle, sir, and in heaven's name, get up. Somebody has plotted something. You cannot too soon find out who and what it is. There, I am up now, but at your peril you fetch a candle yet. Wait two minutes till I get into some dry garments, if any dry there be. Yes, here's my dressing gown. Now run. I did run. I brought the candle, which still remained in the gallery. He took it from my hand, held it up, and surveyed the bed, all blackened and scorched. The sheets drenched, the carpet round, swimming in water. What is it? And who did it? He asked. I briefly related to him what had transpired, the strange laugh I had heard in the gallery, the step ascending to the third story, the smoke, the smell of fire which had conducted me to his room, in what state I had found matters there, and how I, how I had deluged him with all the water I could lay my hands on. 
He listened very gravely. His face, as I went on, expressed more concern than astonishment. He did not immediately speak when I had concluded. Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax, I asked. Mrs. Fairfax? No. What the deuce would you call her for? What can she do? Let her sleep unmolested. Then I will fetch Leah and wake John and his wife. Not at all. Just be still. You have a shawl on. If you are not warm enough, you may take my cloak yonder. Wrap it about you and sit down in the armchair there. I will put it on. Now place your feet on the stool to keep them out of the wet. I'm going to leave you for a few minutes. I shall take the candle. Remain where you are till I return. Be as still as a mouse. I must pay a visit to the second story. Don't move, remember, or call anyone. He went. I watched the light withdraw. He passed up the gallery very softly, unclosed the staircase door with as little noise as possible, shut it after him, and the last ray vanished. I was left in total darkness, in his room by herself. I listened for some noise, but heard nothing. A very long time elapsed. I grew weary. It was cold, in spite of the cloak, and then I did not see the use of staying, as I was not to rouse the house. I was on the point of risking Mr. Rochester's displeasure by disobeying his orders, when the light once more gleamed dimly on the gallery wall, and I heard his unshod feet tread the matting. I hope it is he, thought I, and not something worse. He re-entered, pale and very gloomy. I found it all out, said he, setting his candle down on the washstand. It is as I thought. How, sir? He made no reply, but stood with his arms folded, looking on the ground. At the end of a few minutes, he inquired in a rather peculiar tone, I forget whether you said you saw anything when you opened your chamber door. No, sir. Only the candlestick on the ground. But you heard an odd laugh. You have heard that laugh before, I should think, or something like it? Yes, sir. There is a woman who sews here, called Grace Poole. She laughs in that way. She's a singular person. Just so. Grace Poole. You have guessed it. She is, as you say, singular. Very. Well, I shall reflect on the subject. Meantime, I am glad that you are the only person, besides myself, acquainted with the precise details of tonight's incident. You are no talking fool. Say nothing about it. I will account for this state of affairs, pointing to the bed, and now return to your own room. I shall do very well on the sofa in the library for the rest of the night. It is near four. In two hours, the servants will be up. Good night, then, sir, said I, departing. He seemed very surprised, very inconsistently so, as he had just told me to go. What, he exclaimed, are you quitting me already, and in that way? You said I might go, sir, but not without taking leave, not without a word or two of acknowledgement and goodwill, not, in short, in that brief, dry fashion. Why, you have saved my life, snatched me from a horrible and excruciating death, and you walk past me as if we were mutual strangers? At least shake hands. He held out his hand. I gave him mine. He took it first in one, then in both of his own. You have saved my life. I have the pleasure in owing you so immense a debt. I cannot say more. Nothing else that has been would have been tolerable to me in the character of creditor for such an obligation. But you, it is different. I feel your benefits no burden, Jane. He paused, gazed at me. Words almost visible trembled on his lips, but his voice was checked. Good night again, sir. There is no debt, benefit, burden, obligation in the case. I knew, he continued, you would do me some good in some way at some time. I saw it in your eyes when I first beheld you. Their expression and smile did not, again he stopped, did not, he proceeded hastily, strike delight to my very inmost heart, so for nothing. People talk of natural sympathies. I have heard of good genii. There are grains of truth in the wildest fable. My cherished preserver, good night. Strange enough was his voice, strange fire in his look. I'm glad I happened to be awake, I said, and then I was going. What? You will go? I'm cold, sir. Cold? Yes, and standing in a pool. Go then, Jane, go. But he still retained my hand, and I could not free it. I bethought myself of an expedient. I think I heard Miss Fairfax move, sir, said I. Well, leave me. He relaxed his fingers, and I was gone. I regained my couch, but never thought of sleep. Till morning dawned, I was tossed on buoyant on a buoyant but unquiet sea, where billows of trouble rolled under surges of joy. So that's a metaphor, guys. I thought sometimes I saw beyond its wild waters a shore, sweet as the hills of Beulah. And now and then a freshening gale, wakened by hope, bore my spirit triumphantly towards the bourne. But I could not reach it. Even in fancy, a counteracting breeze blew off the land and continually drove me back. Sense would resist delirium. Judgment would warn passion. Too feverish to rest, I rose as soon as the day dawned.